Okay, so in a star search, we have a heuristic evaluation function which contains the cost um, plus uh, the cost up to the current node plus uh, the heuristic estimate of the cost from the current node to the goal. Okay, um, and the heuristic um, estimate has to be admissible. That means it is not allowed to overestimate the actual cost from the current state to the goal. Okay, so we need a heuristic to be admissible. Um, and then we can prove that the A-star algorithm is optimal. Yeah. That's what we did last time. Are there any questions about this or maybe about the proof? Okay, and, uh, but we still have the problem that a star search is kind of similar to breadth first search. That means it consumes a lot of memory because um, all the nodes along the search front are stored. And therefore, we, um, I mean, it's quite straightforward. We do the same thing we did before. We do iterative deepening, but not on the depth bound. Um, rather, we do it, um, so we limit the heuristic value f, f of s. So we put a limit on f of s, produce all nodes up to this limit, then the search uh, tree is finite, and once uh, this search is finished and it is not successful, then we increase the limit. That's how it goes. Okay, so then we looked at an empirical comparison um, of the different uh, search uh, algorithms we have seen yet, and we did this on the 8 puzzle. And we can clearly see that, of course, we have a, a, a big advantage from using heuristics. And we also see that uh, the two heuristics um, are quite different. That means heuristic H2 is much better than heuristic H1. Um, would you have expected this, that heuristic H2 is better than H1? I mean, we should expect this because uh, heuristic H2 does not underestimate that strongly as heuristic H1 does. H1 gives a strong underestimate, H2 um, much less a strong underestimate. That means H2 is closer to the real cost than H1 is, so it's a better heuristic. And so it should perform better. Yeah? And it does, as you can see here, if you compare the number of steps. But what is not uh, so obvious is that heuristic H2 is better with respect to the uh, absolute computation time. And if you look, for example, here, you see H2 is worse than H1. Huh? And here too, here too, and from here on H2 is better. What's the reason why H2 is worse than H1 for these uh, smaller search trees? It might even happen that H2 would be worse here. What, what's the reason? I mean, it's not completely obvious that a better heuristic has to be faster. Why? 
Because yeah. So the overhead, the computational overhead per node is of course bigger for the better heuristic. Yeah? I mean the better heuristic, you can see it, um, reduces the effective branching factor. So finally, if our tree becomes large enough, there is a point where heuristic H2 will be better, definitely. Yeah? But um, this point may be um, on very large trees. Look at this uh, uh, graph here. So if we draw the size of the tree here, and uh, um, yeah, let's put the time. The time for for the complete search on a certain tree. Or let's no, no not the, um, let's put the depth of the tree here. And then we know that the branching factor is 1.3 for H2 and 1.5 for H1. And we also know that our time, computation time, how does it increase with um, the depth and the branching factor? it grows exponentially. Yeah? I mean this is the effective branching factor and if you look at the definition this is defined as um, the branching factor for a tree with the same size that means with the same number of nodes but it would be a constant branching factor and if you have a constant branching factor then uh, the time t of the depth is a constant times branching factor to the power depth. Yeah? That's how it goes. Okay, so then this means for H1 we have some exponentially increasing function. So this is H1 and we have uh, um, a time uh, is proportional B to, uh, so, sorry, uh, 1.5 to the power D. Okay. And for H2, we have uh, 1.3 to the power D, which means, um, so the growth is slower, um, but the overhead is bigger. The overhead is bigger, so the cost per node is bigger. So let's write it like that. Is equal to C1 times. And for H2, we have a bigger, a larger constant. That means it starts here at a higher level. Huh? But it's a little bit slower. So that means it maybe goes like that. And there is a point a critical point and um, so for trees larger than this critical point H2 is better. Huh? So this is H2 T is C2 times 1.3 the power T. But below this critical point uh, the better heuristic may be worse. Okay, now, yeah, we talked about how to find a good heuristic and the idea is simplify the problem, solve the simplified problem and take the cost 
for the simplified problem as your heuristic estimate. Okay, so now let's start with uh, games. We are talking about two, two player games. Examples are chess, checkers, Othello, Go. I don't know whether the Germans know Othello. This is in Germany, it's called Reversi. Huh? Um, these, these games are all deterministic. Um, so that means if I make a move, um, then there is no random influence on the effect. Huh? Um, it, they're observable, so I know the state of the game all the time. Um, yeah. In contrast to this, card games are different. They're only partially observable. Why? I don't know the cards of my opponent. Yeah. I don't know the, par the cards of the opponents. Um, yes. And um, these are so-called uh, zero-sum games. That means the much I win, the much my opponent loses. Uh, um, there are different games. Um, they are called cooperative games where it's possible that all players may win. Uh, but not with these games here. And we are talking about these zero-sum games now. Okay, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of a repetition. I already in, uh, mentioned that the average branching factor for chess is between 30 and 35. Um, and now, if we do 50 moves per player, which means this, I mean, a move per player is called a half move. So altogether we have 100 moves and the surgery has a size of around 30 to the power 100, which is 10 power 148, and this is too much. Uh, it's way too much. Okay. Um, and we do have real-time requirements. That's very important. Um, I mean, my opponent typically is not uh, willing to wait for weeks or years or maybe even centuries uh, until he can do the next move. Huh? And I mean, there are games where you really have only a few seconds time uh, to, to plan the next move. Um, and from these real-time requirements, it immediately follows that we have a limited search, search depth. And this search depth, it really depends on the time I have. Uh, um, I need a heuristic, or these games, algorithms, they work with a heuristic evaluation function. Here it's called B. Um, and this evaluation function evaluates the leaf nodes. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, what is a leaf node? We, we would call a leaf node a node which is at our search front. So if I'm able to search, uh, let's say, eight half moves, then at the end of this uh, tree, these are the leaf nodes. Um, okay, we call the two players max and min. So I am max and my opponent is min. Why? Because I... I am trying, from my view, uh, to maximize the outcome of my game. And of course, my opponent, he tries to minimize the outcome from my view. Huh? OK. Um, yeah. And we also always assume that my opponent, Min, always plays optimal. So I assume my opponent is an optimal player. Uh, I mean, it's kind of the worst case for me. Uh, um, yeah, and of course, I try to maximize the evaluation of my moves, and uh, min uh, minimizes the evaluation of his moves. Okay, now let, let's look at an example. 
So we, here we have a look ahead of four half moves. Yeah? So that's me, and that's why this level is called max. Then that's the move of my opponent, and that's why we have a min level here, a max level again, a min level, and this is the, the search horizon. So I can uh, look ahead four half moves, and now what happens is um, I produce the whole search tree up to this depth, and the leaf nodes, they are being evaluated. I mean, each of the leaf nodes is one board position, a definite board position, and now I need a heuristic evaluation function that gives me an evaluation of the board position, okay? And now, now it is different uh, to what we had before. In, in our uh, normal search procedures, in A star for example, the heuristic evaluation function is the better the smaller the value is, and here it's different. So for me it's, it means a, a board position is the better the higher the value is, and for the opponent it's, it's uh, the other way around. Okay, so we've got these uh, evaluations of the board positions, and now what we do is um, we go bottom up. So here is a min node, so we take the minimum of these two nodes, and here two, and here two, everywhere. Huh? Okay, there is a max node, so we take the maximum of these guys, and here two. And here we, have a, here we have a min node again, so we take the minimum. And there are a max node. Uh, that means we have the maximum again. Yeah, okay. So, um, what does that mean for me as a player? What will I do? I will make the uh, Yes. I make this move. Why? Because it's better. Because three is bigger than two. Huh? Um, and then my opponent will make this move because it's worse, and I will make this move because it's better, and my opponent will make this move. So this is the path the game would go would go, not will go, would go with the knowledge we have here at this point. So this is only, this only tells me I have to take this decision here. It does not tell me what will happen here. That means my opponent will take this move. Why? Why is it not for sure that the opponent will take this move? If we assume that the strength of my opponent is the same as mine, then the opponent may, uh, will also have a look ahead of four, of four half moves, and that means if the, the opponent is here, it will of course expand the tree uh, one level further. And so it, uh, the opponent will have more knowledge, deeper knowledge. And uh, that may change the decisions. And that happens all the time. So um, expanding this whole tree for four half moves is just for my decision, for this decision here. Huh? Is that clear? Yeah, and that's what we call uh, min-max search. Okay, and now we look at a very nice improvement of this uh, min-max search. We have the same search tree. But we can do a very nice pruning. If you look at this tree, then there are some uh, dotted branches like here and these, and all the dotted parts of the search tree, uh, they 
I don't have to traverse them. I can just omit them. So uh, I would never look at these subtrees here, which saves me a lot of computation time. And why? Let's, let's start uh, looking here. So we, we have already evaluated this part of the tree, and that has to be done. Huh? Um, but now uh, look here. So um, this min node gives us a 3. Um, so for the moment, that means um, the maximum here is or would be what would it be? So suppose we don't know what's happening here. We have not evaluated this part here. We have just seen this. What does that mean for this max node? It's three or higher. Three or higher, that's important, yes. Yeah? It's greater than or equal to three. I mean, it can be bigger because if we would get um, a 5 here, then it would be 5. If we would get 20 here, it would be 20. Huh? But if we would get 1, then um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't change. Because then 3 uh, uh, remains the maximum. Yeah, that's the point. So, we travel down here and now we actually evaluate this node. Huh? And we see that this is a 1 and that means at this minimum node, at this minimum node, the value can, cannot be bigger than 1. Huh? Because it's a minimum node. So it can, cannot, it could only become smaller than 1. So we already have a 1. Um, now if we would have a minus 5 here, then of course the minimum would be minus 5. But if we would get a 20 here, the minimum would still be 1. Okay, and that's why here we can write less than or equal to 1. And that means for this maximum node, that this part is not relevant at all. So when we have seen this one here, we don't have to look at the rest. It's completely irrelevant. It doesn't uh, change anything. So we can omit all this. Uh, I mean, these are only two nodes here. Yeah. But let's look at, at this part because uh, here it's more dramatic. So we have evaluated this part, we get a 2 here and that means uh, for the moment we have a 2 here as a maximum. Um, and then we go down here and we get a 2 here. That means here we get less than or equal to 2 which would not change anything up here. So we can omit this guy here. And we get a 2 here on this maximum node. And that means this minimum node um, is less than or equal to 2. Huh? It cannot, beca cannot become bigger than 2. Um, and that's why we do not have to evaluate all this part here. Why don't, why don't we need to evaluate all this part here? I mean, what we would get, it, it may be something smaller than 2. We may get 1, and then this, of course, would change. It would be 1. But why does this not matter? Because we... At this point here? No, this is a minimum node. This is a minimum node. So if we would get a 3 here, it wouldn't matter. But if we would get a 1 here, it would matter, and we would have 1, so it would change. But it doesn't matter. 
Why? Because the max player takes the higher value on the left side. Because three is always higher than any Yes, player. because up here we already have a move with an evaluation of three, which is this guy here. So, um, and we know already this can only become smaller, so the, the, whole, uh, the whole right hand side doesn't matter. I already know at this point, I know I will take this move. Because this can never become bigger, it can just become smaller. <coughs> Is this clear now? No answer. So it's not clear. How can I help you? We clearly have to distinguish between min and max nodes. Shall we repeat this, this point here, because maybe it's easier? Is this clear, what happened here? Shall I repeat it? Please give an answer. Yes? No? What? You don't need to repeat it. Okay, how about this? Yes or no? No. Okay, fine. So let's continue. Um, yeah, okay. So let's, let's look at the procedure again. At every leaf node, the evaluation function is being calculated. No? That's what we get here. Um, yeah, it's actually not completely true, not at every leaf node. So maybe we can prune parts of the tree and then of course we will not calculate. But at the beginning, I mean at least, I have to go down to the first node um, and evaluate this guy. Yeah? Um, yes, so, and then for every maximum node the current largest child value is saved Oh yes, is saved in a value called alpha. That's important. Huh? For every maximum node, the current largest child value is saved in, uh, in this uh, variable alpha. So that means, and for every minimum node, the current smallest child value is saved in a variable beta. Okay, here we have a minimum node. And we save the current uh, smallest child value, which is zero, in this value beta here. Huh? Okay, and then here we have a maximum node and we save the current largest child value in uh, this um, variable alpha. And here in, again we have a variable beta and save uh, the smallest child node and here the largest child node in alpha. No? I mean, we don't know yet what comes out here, so this is a, a temporary um, alpha value. No? And it may be changed when we get some outcome from the right side. No? But actually it will not be changed because at this minimum node, at that point we know less than or equal to 2. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and then we have this, um, yeah, uh, this uh, case uh, decision. If at a minimum node k the current value beta is less than or equal to alpha, then the search under this node can end. Uh, um, here alpha is the largest value of a maximum node in the path from the root to this node. No? Okay, now let's look at this again and look at the example. If at a minimum node k the current value beta is less than or equal to alpha, um, yeah. 
Look here. This is a minimum node. If at a minimum node the current value beta is less than or equal to alpha and alpha is the maximum of the max nodes on the path from the root to the current node. Okay, this path only contains this node. So, um, yeah. And now, what did it say? If beta is less than or equal to alpha. And that's what we have. <coughs> beta is less than or equal to alpha and therefore we can stop the search on the whole right hand side of the tree. Look at uh, this point for example. That's the same thing. Beta is less than or equal because of this one here. Beta is less than alpha we had here. Um, yeah. And that's why we do not look at these uh, nodes. And the same thing symmetrically, if at a maximum node the current value alpha is greater than or equal to beta, then the search under L can end. And beta is the smallest value of a minimum node in the path from the root to the current node L. Okay, now we can look at the source code. Um, this is being implemented in a recursive manner, of course, and we have two function, functions, a function alpha, beta, max, and a alpha, beta, min, which recursively call each other. Uh, so it's, it's quite obvious. Let, let's look at the tree. So we start, we call alpha, beta, max, and this recursively calls alpha, beta, min here, and this calls alpha, beta, max, and so on. Okay, alpha, beta, max gets as, uh, as parameters a current node and these two values, alpha and beta. Yeah? That's important. I mean, these, these values, alpha and beta, they have to be transferred from level to level down. For example, let's look at this example. Um, if, for example, we have this alpha value equal to 3 here, um, this has to be transferred all the way down here. And same with the beta values. Okay, and so first we check whether we uh, reach the depth limit. Uh, so if, whether the current node, this node, is, uh, has reached the depth, depth limit. If we reach the depth limit, that means we are at uh, one of the leaf nodes, um, then we return the rating of the node. So that means we evaluate the current node. Huh? And return, we just return the evaluation, uh, for example, of a board position in a chess game. Okay, otherwise, we produce the successors, so we expand this node, produce the successors, and store them in new nodes. Huh? Um, and now this is a loop that goes, uh, traverses the successor nodes. Suppose we are here, then we produce these three successor nodes, and this while loop just um, um, uh, yeah, loops over these nodes. Okay, so while new nodes is not empty, um, and now what we do now is we do a recursive call of the other function. So now we call alpha, beta, min on the first of, oh, this is German, on the first of new nodes. Yeah? We call alpha, beta, min on the first of our new nodes, and of course we give these parameters alpha and beta. Um, and now, what we now do is we compute, so this alpha, beta, min will return, um, will return a beta value because it's the minimum function. It will return 
uh, a beta value and then we take the maximum of the current alpha and this beta value which will then be the new alpha. Uh? Um, yeah, and I mean we are in a maximum node and that's why we, uh, we compute the maximum here. And now we take this maximum alpha and if alpha is greater than or equal to beta, we return beta. Or let's, let's put it the other way around. If beta is less than or equal to alpha, we return beta. That's what we said here. Um, here. If at a maximum node, the current value alpha is greater than or equal to beta, or if beta is less than or equal to alpha, um, then we return beta. Yeah. And then, um, of course, we delete the first node. I mean, here we use the first node, and here we delete this first node from our list new nodes. And we return our final value alpha. That's what happens inside alpha beta max. And here we don't have to look at this. This is perfectly symmetric, just that we, um, we take the minimum here. Yeah. And uh, this comparison is different. Questions? Okay, yeah, complexity. Yeah, here we have to say a few words. Um, now the computation time, we cannot give an exact figure of the computation time because it depends on the order in which our child nodes are being evaluated. I mean, look at this example here. Here we have been lucky because we get this one value first. Suppose these are values like 5 and 7, these two. And if we would have evaluated this guy first, we couldn't stop. Huh? We were just lucky because at this minimum node the first successor was smaller than our current alpha. That's the reason why we could stop here. Huh? Also, I mean, uh, let me see. Um, yeah. Here we couldn't stop, but let's see. Here we couldn't stop either. Yeah, this is the first position where we can profit. But here it's the same thing. So if this value uh, would have been uh, bigger than 3, we couldn't stop. Yeah. And um, of course, uh, the same here. So, the, the computation time depends on the order of our leaf nodes. And in the worst case, we just have our exponential uh, uh, complexity b to the power d. And d is the number of half moves. Okay, so now um, let's look at the best case. Go back to the uh, picture. So the best case is if the successors of a minimum node are um, sorted in ascending order. So 
they, the, the values have to increase. Huh? And if at a maximum node, it's the other way around. The best case is if the values decrease. Huh? So now in this case, I mean, it's not, it's not easy to prove this. Uh, Udea Pearl, which is one of the, I would say, one of the big AI pioneers. Um, he is like many other AI pioneers from California. He, lived in Los he lives in Los Angeles and uh, he wrote two uh, famous books. One book, I, I think it was called Search or Search Algorithms, was about search and that's where he proved this. And his second book was called Heuristics. And guess, uh, guess what he uh, wrote in, in this book? Um, he wrote about all the heuristic search stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and uh, he proved actually what we get here. Huh? So if the successors of maximum nodes are sorted in descending order, successor of minimum nodes in the other way around, then the effective branching factor um, reduces to square root of b, which is uh, dramatic. I mean, look at chess. In chess, we have an F, uh, a branching factor of around 35. The square root of 35 is about 6. That's dramatic. It reduces from 35 to 6. Or let's say that would be dramatic because first of all, we have to sort our leaf nodes, which is not easy. Yeah? Um, so, but if, if that happens, then we, the complexity or the number of nodes that have to be evaluated is square root of b to the power d. And now this can be, um, uh, I mean, just by simple uh, algebra, we get b to the power d half. Uh, and that's, that's very important because what does that mean uh, if you look at the depth? That means the, uh, the look-ahead depth you have to do... Um, no, sorry. Um, the time you need for depth D is the same as the time you need for half the depth, okay? So if you, if you do a look ahead of eight half moves, the time you, uh, it takes you is for four half moves. So effectively, your look ahead depth doubles. So if you have the computational resources to do a full search of four half moves, then if the leaf nodes are perfectly sorted, then you, uh, you can do eight half moves look ahead. Okay, yes, I already mentioned the branching factor reduces from 35 to 6 for chess. The search horizon is doubled. Um, okay, and now the important question is what happens in the average case? I mean, the worst case, of course, is if our nodes are sorted um, in the opposite order. The average case is you just have random numbers, huh? a, a random ordering of the leaf nodes, and that's the average case, and it turns out, and that's what uh, Udea Pearl proved, that um, we get b to the power th uh, 3 4 uh, fourth. Huh? Um, oh, sorry, I mean, there is something missing. Of course, I mean here, yeah, a d is missing. Yeah? Here we have b to the power d half, and here we have b to the power 3 fourth d. Okay, um, yes. And uh, as a consequence, if we take um, 3 quarter, um, yeah, 
we, so we, if we take our branching factor 35 to the power 3 quarter, then we get about 14. Huh? And this still is a, um, a, a huge gain. Huh? And that has a, as a consequence, we can have a look ahead of eight half moves instead of six. Okay, um, yes, and we can even improve this further. Um, so here, as you can see here, with a just a random node ordering, we get an average branching factor of about 14. And if we do a heuristic node ordering, uh, so we use a heuristic um, which is not easy to find, but uh, there are heuristics for, for doing a heuristic uh, node ordering, then the, the branching factor reduces uh, to about uh, 7 to 8. So we do, not, we do not get the optimum, which is about 6, but this is not too far from the optimum. Okay, yeah, so that's about deterministic games. Now let's talk about, uh, just uh, give an idea about how non-deterministic games, um, how we can do the, the game tree search there. For example, dice games, they are non-deterministic because every time uh, you roll the dice, uh, there is some random outcome. Yeah? Um, and so what we do then is, so there is, in our search tree, there is a max level, and then there is a dice level, then there comes the min level, dice. So we have between max and min level, there always is the dice level. And now, because we do not know the outcome of the dice in our look ahead of the search, so we just... Um, we just take an, uh, an expected value of the dice. And of course we know this, a dice um, has six different values. Um, and, and so we can just do uh, averaging over the different dice outcomes. Huh? Yeah. That's what we do. Uh, so it, it's not really uh, difficult to implement it for non-deterministic games. Okay, but now a very important point is how do we find these values at the leaf nodes? Uh, I mean, here we need a heuristic evaluation function. We need to evaluate board positions. Uh, um, so maybe we go back to our picture. Here, yeah. So these evaluations, they come out of a heuristic evaluation of the board positions. So I need some chess playing intelligence. So I look at the board and then I would say, okay, this position uh, gets a value of 25 and that position gets a value of 18 and so on. I could actually do it here. So. I have to make a move and now there are 35 possibilities and I produce all 35 successor board positions. And I look at them one after the other. And then I select the move which gives me the best board position. But of course it is better to plan further ahead. And that's why we do, uh, we um, produce the search tree as far as I can. I mean, as far as my limited time resources allow. And then I evaluate these leaf nodes, which of course is much better than just evaluating the immediate successor nodes. Because this is like planning uh, the whole game ahead. So what I actually would like to do is plan um, 100 half moves ahead. Huh? But this is too big. 
Okay. Yeah. And now, how do we get uh, such an evaluation of a board position in chess? So this is just for the example chess. And you see, I mean, I cannot do anything else. I cannot tell you how to, in general, find a heuristic for evaluating game states. Uh, uh, and this is the, the same all the time. If you want to find the heuristic, you really have to look into your problem. And this is extremely problem specific. So we look into chess a little bit. Huh? Um, okay, so first we need a list of relevant features or attributes of our board position. I mean, yeah, of course you could. Yeah, let's, let's start with the basics. So suppose there is our chess board. Is this eight now? Six, seven, eight. So, and we get eight here. Okay, and we have some um, figures here around somewhere. And I look at this position. And what does it mean? I look at this position. I mean, there is, um, in my robot, there would be a video camera that gets a pixel image, and then, I mean, I compare, I may make this move, this move, or this move might be. And then I compare these two guys, and of course there is a difference. The pixels are different here. But this is, of course, uh, this doesn't help me. I mean. Yeah. Um, so I have to come to really semantic information about the chess game. Huh? And currently, no, not currently, I mean the latest, uh, the best uh, now existing chess computer uh, has more intelligence. But the second last, which was this uh, Hydra computer, it just used heuristics like that. These are manually encoded heuristics. So you ask good chess players and ask them, okay, tell me, how can we formally evaluate a uh, board position? And that's what we have here. So we have a list of relevant features um, and we use a linear evaluation function, B of S. S is the state of the board. And then we have a coefficient times material plus another coefficient times pawn structure and king safety, knight in center, bishop diagonal coverage and some others. Uh. Now what is material? Material is material own team minus material opponent. And what is material of a team? It's the number of pawns times 100. So of course the pawns, they are the cheapest uh, um, uh, figures. Then we have the knights, um, which get a, a value of 300, and the bishops with uh, uh, um, 302, and then the rooks 500, so, um, and the queen 900, and so on. Huh? So this is the material of one team, and I take, of course, the difference. Um, this gives me this material value weighted by some weighting factor. Huh? Um, and then there is, I don't know what pawn structure means. Huh? It is defined, uh, you, you have to ask uh, chess experts. And king, of course there is an attribute, king safety and so on. Huh? And the critical point here, of course, are these coefficients a1, a2, a3, and so on. And these are different in different chess computers. Maybe they even should change a little bit depending on the opponent. And that's what these guys did. I mean, in the times of Deep Blue, uh, that won against uh, Kasparov, um, they look at the opponent. It may even happen that there was one, one play 
and uh, the computer lost and then they learn okay uh, it looks like Kasparov uh, uh, puts more emphasis on this or on that and then they tune uh, these coefficients a little bit and hopefully next time the computer wins. Yeah. And, but, I mean, the problem is that if you talk to these chess experts, that's the problem I mentioned already a couple of times, that's a knowledge acquisition problem. How do I get the chess knowledge out of the brain of the expert into the machine? I mean, here it means into these coefficients. Of course, I mean, also these variables are interesting. How do we define pawn structure? This is really critical. And how do we get this knowledge out of the brain of the expert? It is impossible to get it perfectly. We just get an approximation of his knowledge um, and that's the problem. Because these experts, if you ask the experts in critical situations, then they would say, oh, I have the feeling that this is a little bit better than that. And that's it. Huh? I mean, they, they, these experts, they all have their limits. And if they are at the limit, they just tell you, oh, that's just my feeling, I can't tell you why. Okay, yes. Oops, sorry. Uh, but what we could do also is learning heuristics. Yeah? So we use, we use machine learning algorithms and um, so we have these features F1 to Fn and now we use a machine learning algorithm that automatically determines the optimal coefficients for these features. What does it mean for a, coefficient, for a set of coefficients to be optimal? It means that the amount of errors that our uh, agent with these coefficients makes is minimal. So we minimize the errors um, of our chess playing agent. So we are, it's, it's an optimization problem. Huh? So we are looking for, for that set of coefficients that minimizes the squared error in maybe a number of games. Okay, yes. Um, Yeah, maybe we should stop here with the machine learning because we, we didn't talk about machine learning at all. But we will come to this point again when we are in the machine learning chapter and then you will see that we can use supervised learning or we could use supervised learning algorithms or reinforcement learning algorithms for adjusting these parameters. But it is not trivial and that's the reason why up to now there are, is almost no machine learning in chess computers. Okay, yeah, I mean the problem is, yeah, maybe I can motivate this here, the problem is the credit assignment. Huh? So that means if there is a long chess game with, five, with 100 half moves, then the evaluation whether what I have done was successful comes only at the end. I, I do not know before the end whether I win or not. So at the end, the last move, for the last move, I get a direct evaluation whether it was good or not. Huh? So if it's uh, checkmate, then I won and I know this was good. But how about all the moves before? Suppose I lose the game. Maybe all moves in the game were perfect I just made one fault during the whole game. And now how, how can I assign this losing of the game to move number uh, 25? Huh? That's a problem. So uh, this is what we call the credit assignment uh, problem. Uh, how can I assign this credit that I get only at the very end to the correct uh, move? Um, it would be much easier if my chess playing agent would have a teacher 
sitting behind him, beside him, and at, for every move, the teacher tells me, okay, this was good and this was bad, so I get an immediate reward to every move, I can assign it to the move, and then adjust my parameters. But, I mean, this is not really realistic. Suppose there is a chess computer and the human trainer has to tell this computer for every of these millions or zillions of moves uh, the machine trains, whether it was good or not. This is impossible. And uh, so this is, this is the field of reinforcement learning. So I do the whole chess game, get the reward at the end, and then I have to learn something out of it. And that's why this uh, field of reinforcement learning is so hard and so difficult because of this credit assignment problem. Okay, uh, yes, so, yeah, let's talk about the state of the art in uh, chess playing now. Um, yeah, let's look at the, start with the definition by Elaine Rich. You know it already, her definition of artificial intelligence is, um, it is the study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better. Huh? And I mean, if you take this definition, what is a better benchmark than uh, chess computers? Huh? Because, uh, or let's go 20 years back or 30 years back. At that time, definitely, we humans were better than the computers, so it was the best benchmark uh, for a computer to beat the best human chess player and then, of course, this definition is hit perfectly. Uh. Okay, but the, it all started in about 1950 when Claude Shannon, Konrad Suse, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, I mean, we could say these are the four most famous computer scientists of all times. Uh. And they all they all uh, dealt with uh, chess computers. That's, that's kind of uh, fascinating. Yeah? There were no, no, no good computers at that time, but they all uh, were thinking of how to uh, build a chess computer. And they, I, I don't exactly remember, but I know that Alan Turing, he was thinking about machine learning uh, John von Neumann too, but I, I don't know about these two guys. And then in 1955, Arthur Samuel, um, he wrote a program that learns to play, oh, this is an error too. This program did not learn to play chess. It learned to play checkers. In German, that's Dame. Yeah, which is simpler. Um, and he used a rating of the moves by human experts. That's what I said already, which is the easier uh, variant. Yeah. Um, and in 1961, his checkers program bet the fourth best checkers player in the United States. Um, then there was a long silence in uh, interesting uh, successes in, in uh, game playing. In 1990, Tesoro, um, uh, a neuroscientist, he used reinforcement learning with a neural network uh, and did reinforcement learning on, uh, in, and learned to play uh, backgammon. This program uh, became very famous. It's called TD Gammon, uh, and it, w it played at world championship uh, champion level. And then, uh, then we, we are entering the time where the chess computers um, overtook the best uh, human players. I mean, you all, I guess you all know uh, about uh, Deep Blue, which was this. Uh, chess computer that uh, won against Garry Kasparov with a score of 3.5 games to 2.5. So it won uh, 
one game more than Kasparov. And it could, on average, compute 12 half moons moves uh, look ahead. Yeah? Of course, with alpha beta prune. Okay, um, and um, then in 2004, there was this uh, computer called uh, Hydra. Um, it used um, a lot of hardware. On a parallel computer, it used 64 parallel Xeon processors with 3 gigahertz uh, power and 1 gigabyte of memory. Yeah, in 2004, this was not too bad. Um, and the software came from, uh, from computer scientists from Austria and Germany. Um, and actually, oh I, do, oh, I don't remember, and it's not written here. The hardware, which was not cheap at all, it was quite expensive, uh, it was uh, funded by some uh, Arabian oil uh, millionaire. Okay, and for the, for the evaluation of the positions, and this is the critical point, because, I mean, if you do, uh, for example, a 12-move uh, look ahead, um, then there are millions or zillions of board uh, positions that have to be evaluated. So this is the critical point to compute this linear combination of all these features of the board positions, this is really the critical point. And for this, they used an FPGA coprocessor, um, which could evaluate 200 million positions per second. And I mean, there is no chance for a, 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 an ordinary microprocessor to come into this uh, region. No? Okay, and Hydra could do 18 moves look ahead. I mean, not, uh, sorry, not 18 moves, 18 half moves. So as compared to this, yeah? Which is, of course, much better. Yeah, and, and the interesting point was if, if you watched uh, grandmasters, if the grandmasters watched this computer playing, they pretty often, uh, they said, we can't understand what this computer is doing. That's crazy what the computer does. Why did they say this? Because they didn't understand it. Because the look ahead of this computer was farther down than what, what their brain could do. Okay, yeah. So there was nothing new, new about uh, software. It was just uh, they exploited all the hardware power, which gave them a little advantage over the human players. And now in 2009 came Pocket Fritz 4, running on a PDA, and it won the Copa Mercosur. This was somewhere in, in South America, a chess tournament. Oh, in, in Buenos Aires, yeah. Nine wins and one draw again against ten excellent human chess players, three of them grandmasters. And it used this search engine, Hyarx 13, um, which could search less than 20,000 positions per second. Now compare it, what, what did the other guy, 200 million? Yeah. 200 million positions per second. So the raw computing power of this Hydra machine was much higher than Hyarx. Yeah? So um, more than 10,000 times slower than Hydra, is it? But it plays better. It plays better because it has better heuristics built in. And, and yeah, and that's the shorthand. Higher intelligence auto response chess system. So this is really impressive because this is a success of AI and not of hardware. And you see, finally, the more intelligent system wins, even if it's uh, a factor of 10,000 slower than the op its opponent. Okay, yeah, so that's actually all about game playing. So we can uh, start with the next uh, chapter. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, uh, I forgot uh, to talk about Go. 
because, I mean, there is this game of Go which is not at all solved today. Uh, and this is, and that's, that's why I like this definition of Elaine Rich. This is now AI. Uh, AI researchers now look into the Go game. Chess is no, more, no longer interesting, no, not really interesting for AI because chess computers are better than we are. Uh, but uh, Go computers are still at a very bad level. And what's the reason? I mean, if you look at a chessboard, it's 8 times 8, uh, which is uh, 64 um, squares on the, on the board. If you look at a Go game, it is 19 ni times 19, the board, which is almost 400. Huh? And the number of board positions in Go, of course, it increases exponentially with the board size, is much bigger than it is in chess. Yeah? And therefore, there is no chance to do such a alpha, beta game tree search on all the Go positions because the branching factor is extremely large. So we, could, we couldn't even look um, uh, two levels ahead. How do human uh, Go players play? I mean, this is quite intuitive. That, uh, who knows about the game Go? Nobody. I mean, I don't know it perfectly either, but if you take the whole board, um, the one player has the, the white uh, stones and the other one the black ones. And, uh, yeah, 181 white and 180 black stones. So altogether, 361 stones. Eventually, the whole board could be covered by black and white stones. And the goal is, I mean, suppose there is here an area of white stones. And now if I have the black stones and I am able to put such kind of a fence around an area with white stones, then um, I own all these stones. Uh, so I win all of these. And the goal is that one player owns the whole board. Uh, so, and, and maybe this area could contain 50 stones or maybe even 100. And now you, you cannot look at, I mean, uh, there is, maybe it looks like that. You cannot look at each individual uh, board, uh, uh, at each one stone. So you just look at this as an image and you see, oh, there is this big area and I have to be very careful about this big area and maybe there is in this fence, there is this gap and uh, then I have to try to close this gap because this is a big area and so on. So you need some intuitive knowledge and uh, the researchers now, they try to work on this with kind of image processing techniques. Yeah? So you have a little pixel image with these 361 pixels and so on. But it is not solved. The problem is not solved yet. It is an interesting challenge and uh, maybe, maybe you would be interested to uh, dive into this field and do your master project on uh, uh, developing uh, a Go agent. Okay, yeah, so now we come uh, to our next chapter, which is reasoning with uncertainty. And maybe this, uh, this fits uh, quite well to this example of the Go game, because we cannot exploit the information in all detail, so we need to use rough approximate information uh, so we do have uncertainty. We, maybe we also have incomplete information. 
uh, not in case of Go, but in many, many uh, real world examples, we have uncertainty. We do not know the full state of the world. Huh? In, I mean, and in games where there is a dice, or in card games where you don't know the cards of your opponent, you always have uncertainty. Um, and that's why reasoning with uncertainty uh, now is very important in AI. Okay, yeah, let's start with the flying uh, penguin uh, example. Um, we have the knowledge Tweety is a penguin. Penguins are birds and all birds can fly. And from this, of course, we can derive quite easily Tweety can fly. Let's look at it a little bit more formally. If we use uh, first order predicate logic, we could formalize, formalize this with a predicate called penguin. Uh, so, uh, Tweety, penguin of Tweety means Tweety is a penguin. And this is uh, a logical proposition which can be true or false. So, either this is true or it is false. I mean, if I state this predicate, that means it is true. And now I have a rule, penguin of X implies bird of X. This is actually this sentence, penguins are birds. And in logic, this is true. So if I state this, that means if this condition is true, then the conclusion is true. And the same for this rule, bird of X implies fly of X. So that means all birds can fly. And from this we can derive I mean, we can, if we know penguin of Tweety, then we can apply this rule, and we know bird of Tweety, and if we know bird of Tweety, we can apply this rule, and uh, the conclusion is fly of Tweety, which means uh, Tweety can fly. Okay. And this is not really um, what we want or what we, what we know intuitively, we know uh, penguins uh, cannot fly. Why? Why? I mean, because they are a, an exception among the birds. No? We didn't say this here, that they are an exception. Okay, so, um, yeah. We can, we can write such a rule. Penguin of X implies not fly of X. This exactly says penguins cannot fly. Okay, so we just state this, and now we can derive not fly of Tweety, which means Tweety cannot fly. But we can at the same time derive fly of Tweety. We can derive both. So now Tweety can fly and it cannot fly, we have a contradiction. Yeah? The knowledge base is inconsistent, that's the problem we have with classical logic. So if we use classical logic to formalize uh, this, we are in problem. And what is the reason for this problem? The reason is that our logic is monotonic. What does it mean for logic to be monotonic? Um, it means, let's look at our, we have this, this is what we call a knowledge base. We have this knowledge base and then we add to this knowledge base this other rule that penguins cannot fly. And then immediately this, um, this knowledge base becomes inconsistent. If I take these three rules, I can derive uh, Tweety can fly. If I add this other rule we had on the next slide, then I can also derive uh, Tweety cannot fly. Um, and that means I add some rules, so I increase the knowledge base, and then I increase the number of conclusions. I cannot um, 
delete this old conclusion. So the new knowledge does not delete any old knowledge. It just increases the knowledge. And that's why we call such a logic monotonic. So if I would draw such a picture like um, the, yeah, we have the, the size of the knowledge base here to the right. This is the size of the knowledge base and here we draw the number of um, conclusions. Then we, we get some monotonic behavior. But what we would need here is, as soon as we know that penguins cannot fly, this should delete our old conclusion. So we would need actually a curve which would at some point go down again. Yeah? So we would delete this old knowledge. That's why we call um, classical logic monotonic. And that's the problem. That's the, we, the problem is our classical logic is monotonic. And we would need some non-monotonic logics. And logicians have done a lot of research for uh, many years about non-monotonic log logic. But it turns out that this does not really solve um, this problem. But we can solve this problem with probabilistic logic. We, we now um, give a probabilistic statement, like 99% of all birds can fly. I don't know, we should look into biology and then we would know how, uh, what is the real percentage. Yeah? I guess it's more than 99%, but I don't know. But if we write it like that, then the problem is solved. Yeah? Um, because such a statement allows for exceptions. So now it's no longer a contradiction when I say penguins cannot fly because it looks like obviously the penguins are um, among these 1% which cannot, cannot fly. So you see the, the, the strength of using probabilities. We no longer have this exception because we don't have any more this hard true and false world. Okay, yeah. So it can, probabilistic logic can deal with uncertainty. It can also deal with incompleteness. Um, we will see this. We can do heuristic search and we can do reasoning with uncertain and incomplete knowledge. And we will look at this. Yeah? Um, yeah, reasoning with incomplete knowledge, maybe this is a nice illustration about uh, what's going on. I mean, this is a pretty dangerous situation for that guy. And now he could say, okay, let's just sit back and think about what to do but maybe it's too late when he is finished with his reasoning. Yeah? So he has to do a decision under real-time conditions and that means he has incomplete knowledge about the world. Yeah? You have to take a decision and that's what we do all the time when we are somewhere in the traffic with our car or even as a pedestrian and it's a, it may become a dangerous situation it is better to take any decision than to say, okay, let's think about what we could do and what would be the optimal solution. Before you find the optimal solution, you're dead. Huh? Okay, yes. Um, yeah, m maybe we look at this example and then we stop. Um, this is a medical example. If a patient has pain in the right lower abdomen, which is about here, and a raised white blood cell, so more leukocytes than normal, uh, then the patient may have appendicitis, an inflamed appendix. Uh, and we could uh, formulate this with classical logic. There is a variable called stomach pain, right lower, and a variable leukocytes, 
which is greater than 10,000 and this is an and so if this is the case and this then we have appendicitis. That would be classical logic and of course this is not true. Not every patient with these two symptoms has appendicitis. Huh? Um, but with class classical logic we could with the modus ponens rule immediately uh, conclude the patient has appendicitis. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, let's stop here. Next time we will look at different formalisms that try to solve this problem. We start with mycin, a classical approach which uh, used uncertainty and then of course we look at probability theory which is the solution for the problem. Thank you.